Okay, so good evening. We're going to do A Course in Miracles, text chapter three. Um, we'll see how far we go tonight. Uh, I'm, I am recording it and I will post it on, on YouTube for those that weren't able to join. I know there's holidays happening right now and people are traveling. So without further ado, let's start with the atonement without a sacrifice. And this is the central theme that addresses scarcity and sacrifice in, in, and you have to adopt this as new way of thinking as you read on, on, you carry on with the course. Again, you know, as a reminder, the course is addressing the, the decision maker. So it's not addressing you in your wrong mind, but it's addressing you as that which needs to make the decision for wrong-minded or right-mindedness. Both wrong-minded and right-mindedness are still perception but at least right-minded is this corrected perception, corrected wrong-mindedness is right-mindedness. So that in itself is the miracle, is the correction um, and seeing anew of what we have manifested and, and outwardly projected as the universe, the world of body minds, um, and, and obviously the secret dream or what we call the spirit world. And so right-minded perception um, is miracle induced and brings in the memory of God, Holy Spirit, and therefore then starts to change how we view self, because what we look upon in the world is actually a misprojected or misperceived self projected outwards. So atonement without sacrifice, a further point must be perfectly clear before any residual fear still associated with miracles can disappear. And we finished chapter 2.9, and it spoke about the final judgment, which is really just um, all to do with um, God has no judgment over his son. So the final judgment is the recognition that God says, you are my holy son, and no matter what you've dreamt up is not real. So there's nothing to fear. And so it continues here, and it says, a further point must be perfectly clear before any residual fear still associated with miracle can disappear. So, of course, we have this fear, people have this fear that when they awaken or become enlightened or realize true reality, that all their illusions disappear, which is true, and they're so afraid of losing contact with their mothers and fathers and daughters and, and spouses and dog and cat. So they actually like the idea that when we die, we go somewhere and everybody's happy, happy, but still as individual beings, spirit beings. And the truth, the truth about the atonement is when you wake up, the entire universe and spirit will dream disappears. And people are afraid of that. You know? So there's a fear associated with it because the, it's the fear of losing one's identity and individuality, which individuality, separateness, same thing. The crucifixion did not establish the atonement. So... This is, a, I'm going to highlight some of the text, so it's quite important. Crucifixion did not establish the atonement. The resurrection did. And we're going into Easter now, and it's almost like religion celebrates Easter. Okay, of course, it's all about, you know, Easter Monday, the resurrection day. But we love to bring up the crucifixion, and tomorrow's Good Friday. It's the day that Jesus was crucified, or we celebrate it. We recognize it as the day that Jesus was crucified. And so we get trapped in that suffering. And this, address, this chapter addresses it quite cleverly. And it says here, many sincere Christians have misunderstood this. No one who is free of the belief in scarcity could possibly make this mistake. So the belief in scarcity is what makes us believe that there was suffering and that Someone needed to die for us to live because scarcity means we don't have. And so someone sacrifice and saves us. And that's, that's upside down thinking. That's wrong-minded thinking. If the crucifixion is seen from an upside down point of view, it does appear as if God permitted and even encouraged one of his sons, look at that way it says it, to suffer because he was good. And that's just absurd. Why would God permit Jesus to suffer because he was good? That's just, just absurd. Um, 
the, the fact that Jesus chose to be crucified, I know chose sounds like a, a, a bit of a paradox. Why would he choose to suffer or choose to, well, he chose to demonstrate resurrection ascension. So he willingly um, allowed himself to be crucified. This particular unfortunate interpretation, which arose out of projection, okay, so again, the whole world, body, mind, all activities is because of projection. The mind, the singular son of God mind has projected this entire universe, this planet, and all the people on it, has led to many people being bitterly afraid of God. Such anti-religious concepts enter into many religions. So in actual fact, think of religion, such anti-religious concepts exist in all of them. Okay. Yet the real Christian should pause and ask, how could this be? And this is a question all searchers have asked. How could God do this? You know? it is, is it likely that God himself would be capable of such kind of thinking, which his own words have clearly stated is unworthy of his son? So God doesn't believe in sacrifice and definitely not in suffering. The best defense, as always, is not to attack another person's position, but rather to protect the truth. So whenever someone says something, a religious friend has this negative connotation or upside down thinking connotation about what the crucifixion is, don't attack it. You simply know the truth and, and you have no need to even explain it. But if asked why your perception is what it is, you can protect the truth by explaining right-minded thinking. It is unwise to accept any concept, which is, of course, what human beings do, if you have to invert a whole frame of reference in order to justify. Think about what religion does. It's constantly inverting concepts to justify Jesus crucified, died for our sins. Jesus ascended, now we're saved. And this procedure is painful in its minor applications and generally tragic on a wider scale. Of course, the whole world's built on this premise that someone died, someone suffered, someone was cruelly killed in order for us to live. Persecution or have eternal life frequently results in an attempt to justify the terrible misperception that God himself persecuted his own son on behalf of salvation. And that is just madness okay why would he do that why would it even be needed if god is loved why wouldn't he just end the show and just bring everyone home right so that's a question it's often frequently asked no one has the answer well the answer is because god can't will you to will something that you don't will yourself but he knows that once you will his will be done then you'll finally wake up to the reality that you've never left the dream you know never, never left god the very words are meaningless it has been particularly difficult to overcome this because although the error itself is no harder to correct than any other, many have been unwilling to give, up, give it up in view of its prominent value as a defense. Why? Jesus died for our sins. We soldiers for Jesus. Jesus is our savior. Screw every other religion. Everybody else is evil. Everybody else killed Jesus. Okay. In, mild, in milder forms, and this takes it into quite a nice analogy you know the parent says it hurts me more than it hurts you and feels exonerated in beating a child right how can it possibly hurt the child more i mean the parent more than it hurts the child because i'm a more well then if you're feeling guilty and already hurt by punishing the child then perhaps punishment isn't needed perhaps there's a better way to do it can you believe our father really thinks this way and if people do because they love that idea that we are made in God's image and therefore we can behave that way because surely God behaves as a vengeful parent that disciplines his children, punishing them for their own good. It's, 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 it's absurd, absurd at the best point. It is so essential that all such thinking be dispelled, that we must be sure that nothing of this kind remains in your mind. So any idea of sacrifice and punishment and retribution and not good enough and not an unworthy and must have done something wrong, sin, guilt, and fear needs to get out of your mind or you will reincarnate. The whole benign lesson, the atonement teaches, is lost 
if it is tainted with this kind of distorted distortion in any form, which it always is in terms of the, the point of duality. And many, many a so-called spiritualist or Course in Miracles student wants to shoehorn the whole atonement principle and the whole Course in Miracles into a dualistic frame of mind or thinking. And it cannot because non-duality, no duality, there's no you and God, it's you as an extension of and therefore a part of God. The statement, vengeance is mine, and man, do they love this. You know, think about Reservoir Dogs and, and Quentin Tenaratino's movie. He loves this. You know, they get up and quote, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. You know, really booming voice is a misperception by which one assigns his own evil past to God. The evil past has nothing to do with God. He did not create it, and he doesn't maintain it. God does not believe in retribution because he's unconditionally loving. His mind does not create that way. In actual fact, God's mind creates, ours makes. He does not hold your evil deeds against you. This is vital that you not only believe this, that you transcend the belief understanding into knowing. And that's vital if you truly want to experience transcendence and be knowingly yourself like the great sages like Maharaji, uh, Ramana Maharaji, uh, Papaji, you know, and Jesus. It really just transcended duality completely. Be sure, be very sure, not just be sure, be very sure, it says, okay, that you recognize how utterly impossible this assumption is. What assumption? That God would hold it something against you, okay? And how, enti how entirely it, it arises from projection. You projected the world, you don't like what you make, you destroy it. And now you believe that what created you destroys you too. This kind of error is responsible for a host of related errors, including the belief that God rejected Adam and forced him out of the Garden of Eden. Now, God never rejected Adam because Adam's still asleep. God knows Adam as his son. It's all symbolic. Adam is actually the, symbol, the symbolism for Christ's mind. And simply Christ's mind fell asleep in the garden. And in his dream, God took his rib and created uh, Eve, duality, yin yang, masculine, feminine, and now the one, the masculine pursues the feminine, vice versa, and so the story of the of the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve is simply the story of us falling asleep, and nowhere does it say that Adam wakes up from the dream because Eve is still in his dream. The rib taking the whole thing is his dream, and nowhere does it say he wakes up. And in actual fact, in his dream, once Eve is created. Um, God says, Adam, where are you? Can't find you. The idea that God can't find Adam that is in Eden in heaven is just absurd. And of course, then that makes you that God is a creature, a character, a being, and Adam is a creature and, and Eve is a creature. And that's the, the sense of duality. The separation starts in, in Adam's dream. So this kind of, is, this kind of error is it responsible for our belief in heaven, earth, you know, heaven and hell, or heaven and, and hell and earth and somewhere in between there's uh, spirits. You know. This kind of error is responsible for war. This kind of error is responsible for hate and justification of hate and picking a side. And either we're anti or pro Putin or anti or pro whatever. And so we've always got to pick a side when someone has to be punished. And the minute we want to hold someone responsible for whatever atrocity we believe has happened, you've made it real. You bought into it, made it real. Okay. So I have made every effort to use words that are almost impossible to distort, almost, but human beings can. But it is always possible to twist symbols around if you so wish. Sacrifice is a notion totally unknown to God. I'll underline that twice because it's that important. It arises solely from fear. And frightened people can be vicious. Sacrificing in any way is a violation of my injunction that you should be merciful. Even as your father in heaven is merciful. So forgive us our trespasses as we are forgiven our trespasses. You know? It has been hard for many Christians to realize that this applies to themselves. And this keeps referring to Christians. So why would it do so? Well, because A Course in Miracles is specifically written 
for Christians that want to go in not necessarily leave Christianity, but awaken deeper into the mysteries of the self, into the understanding of God, the experience, the experience of Christ's mind and God, as opposed to the studying about the duality of God. It's really wanting to allow the essence of self to permeate through the entire being knowingly. We, and that's what we call spirituality. It's wanting to be spirit in its ality, in its finality, in its totality, spirituality. It wants to know thyself, to thyself be true. And it says that further down in the chapter, it, it, it keeps rising the know yourself. To terrorize is to attack. And this results in rejection of what the teacher offers. Okay, so sorry. So God, God, good teachers never terrorize their students. Okay. So if I've ever terrorized you, please forgive me. <laughs> to terrorize is to attack. And, and remember that when you have students and they, and they disagree with you, don't attack them. Listen, them. listen to them out. Listen to what they have to say. Accept their perspective for themselves. And if they're willing to listen, give them your perspective. Don't get into debate, though. Okay, so to terrorize is to attack. And so don't say, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. You, how do you think that way? Because you're attacking. And then you become exactly like the persecuting Christians. Don't. The result is learning failure. So don't attack because people, the minute they attack, they switch off. And this is what religion is trying to do, is try to force dogmatically with fear um, the idea of God and salvation into people's minds, but it's all fear-based, which means it's forced, you know, and it's a grudge purchase, and therefore it's failed, and it's failing, and Christianity's dying, we're aware of that, okay? And other religions keep growing, because uh, they're just as fear-based, and they're going to have their time too. So I believe the, the next one that's going to grow, the way that Christianity grew is the Muslim faith, and that too will have a time span, because it's not God that's responsible, because the Muslim God and the, and the Christian God and the Jewish God is the same God. We just decided to follow and head in that direction, God direction, in a different way, with different symbols and different rituals and different dogmas. God is still God and God is universal and uh, God is the only reality. Yeah, so uh, it's just interesting and, and, and entertaining to watch as long as you don't take any of it seriously. I have been correct, correctly referred to as the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world, but those who represent, oh, they love this, represent the, the, the lamb as a blood stain, as blood stain, okay, do not understand the meaning of that symbol. And how many people do you hear saved by the blood of Jesus? Saved by the blood of Jesus. Yeah? <laughs> the poor man's still bleeding. You know, and actually he's no longer a man. He's now the awakened Christ mind. But we love the image. We love the identification, the personification, the objectification of the deity of salvation. Because then, you know, I just give my life to Jesus and I'm saved. Well, Jesus didn't come to die for our sins and those who ever, whoever shall believe in him shall have eternal life. Jesus came to demonstrate that there is no sin, that there is no death. And that if you believe in what he believes in, then you have eternal life because you'll know yourself as the eternal life of God. And that's vital, vital, vital to understand. It's, it's so close to Christian understanding. It just requires an inversion and looking inward as opposed to outward. So Jesus died for your sins. And if you believe in him, there's eternal life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everybody else out. And this is saying, this is Christ saying, no. Believe that what I did is possible. Not only possible, I did it. I transcended death. Okay. I, 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 resurrected my body my mind projected back into it i resurrected it and then i dissolved it okay and i ascended into heaven why where's heaven everywhere where's how did he ascend into heaven he dissolved the body mind and disappeared in the in front of the disciple because now he's part of the collective mind and if you believe it's possible because i've now demonstrated it is then you'll believe it's possible for you to do it too and what it means is you start to see miracle mindedness and you start to dissolve the idea and the identification with a body-mind. And the minute you do, you transcend. So follow in my footsteps is live like I do. Don't just preach about me, but live as if you were me. Unconditionally loving, compassion, 
I seek mercy, forgiveness, not sacrifice. Correctly understood, it is a, it is a very simple symbol that speaks of my innocence and therefore yours. The lion and the lamb lying together, down together, symbolizes that strength and innocence. Vitally, vitally important. So lion and the lamb equal strength and innocence. Okay. Are not in conflict, but naturally live in peace. Blessed are the pure of heart, beautiful lion. Okay. For they shall see God is another way of saying the same thing. And actually it's not see God, but it's to know God with it. Because those eyes stop seeing once you awaken. There are no more eyes. A pure mind knows the truth, and this is its strength. It does not confuse destruction with innocence because it associates innocence with strength, not weakness. And what does the world call innocence? Okay, it calls it weakness. Innocence is capable, sorry, innocence is incapable of sacrificing anything because the innocent mind has everything and strives only to protect its wholeness. In other words, not to deviate from the knowing. It cannot project an innocent mind, an awakened innocent mind. In other words, knowingly that it is the Holy Son of God, cannot project and project itself and see itself as people, places, things, and events. It can only honor other minds, knowing that everyone is full of thoughts and therefore mind, but there's only one capital M mind. Because honor is the natural greeting of the truly loved to those who are like them. The namaste statement. The love I am recognizes the love you are. The God within recognizes the God within. The lamb taketh away the sins of the world in a sense, in the sense that the state of innocence or grace, beautiful word, is one in which the meaning of the atonement is perfectly apparent. The atonement is entirely unambiguous. It is perfectly clear because it exists in light. So there is, and darkness is actually simply a, an illusion, doesn't actually exist. There is no darkness in light. Lots of people love to say, yeah, but you need the darkness to know the light. No, you don't. Okay. Darkness is an idea, light is truth. Only the, only the attempts to shroud it in darkness have made it inaccessible to those who do not choose to see. So awakening is a choice to see anew. It's a willingness to align your will, which was to create the illusion. Now you choose to align your will with what you want to be happy with God's will, which is, I want my, my son to be happy. So I align my will to be happy with God's will, knowing that the minute I willingly choose to be happy and to be shown a new way to see this, God, Holy Spirit will direct me in that, in that way. The atonement itself radiates nothing but truth. So it is pure truth. Okay. It therefore epitomizes harmlessness and sheds only blessings. So be careful when you're judging, you're not shedding blessing. Holy sons of God, Course in Miracles students, we're a Course in Miracles students, we know why, why, and everybody else is wrong. Careful. Careful that you're not judging. It could not do this if it arose from anything but perfect innocence. Innocence is wisdom because it is unaware of evil illusions and evil does not exist. Okay, how can we know there's evil people? No, there's unloving people. They don't, they've forgotten their love, but evil doesn't exist. The devil doesn't exist. Satan doesn't exist. Demons do not exist. They do as projections of ourselves in the illusion, but in reality, they don't. They may even exist in this space-time dimension. We see ghosts and spirits. Why? Because they're projections of ourselves. And what's a projection of yourself? An illusion. The projection is an illusion. The film is on inside the camera. Light shines through it. It projects on the screen. Is there a character on the screen? No. It's all illusion. The film is in, in the camera, and the camera is a source. It is either perfectly aware of everything that is true. The resurrection demonstrated that nothing can destroy truth. So why? He dissolves into the reality. God, sorry, good can withstand any form of evil as light abolishes forms of darkness. The atonement is therefore the perfect lesson. It is the final demonstration. So the atonement, think of the atonement as awakening to oneness. It is the final demonstration that all other lessons I taught are true. If you can accept this one, 
general this one generalization now there will be no need to learn from from many smaller lessons if you realize from all errors you you are released from all errors if you believe this so what was jesus fundamental teachings in the bible for example it said love the lord your god and put now the gods before him with all your heart with all your mind with all your with all your being so love the lord your god first and foremost above all and then he brought in i mean it's the most amazing passage it's like nothing real could be threatened nothing unreal exists here in lies the peace of god it's like a a singular sentence that defines total reality it's a single story with just a few amount of words and it explains the entire thing so love the lord your god with all your heart with all your might with all your with all your being okay and then love one another as i've loved you that's what he came to teach now if you take the rest of the 10 commandments and you bounce those 10 commandments against that you'll realize you can't rank them you can't rank order them you can't decide which one's more important or which one's more punishable and which one's a better commandment than the other because you can't murder you can't steal you can't covet why because it's all love your god love love lord your god with all your heart with all your mind with all your thoughts with all your being with your words the very essence that you are and put no other above him and love your neighbor as you love yourself with the lord of god in your heart so if you love everyone else, your neighbor as yourself and where God exists, what else is there to do? Where, where can darkness exist other than in dream? So the atonement is there for the perfect lesson. And this is what the Course in Miracles is about. The Course in Miracles is about the perfect way to get to the atonement through the practice of forgiveness and the reality, the realization that the reality of God is non-duality and that you've never left God. It is the final demonstration that all the other lessons I taught are true, meaning as a man thinketh, so he becomes, you know, as a man judges, so he shall be judged by what? By himself. Those who have shall have more. Those who don't even that shall be taken away. Jesus' teachings were beautiful. But what does the Bible consist about? What did they just talk about his life? And he did this and he did that. And he did this. Forget about what he did. Just follow the teaching. If you can accept this one generalization now, there will be no need to learn from many smaller lessons. Okay, so very clear. The innocence of God is the true state of the mind of his son. Wow, okay? So the innocence of God is your true state of mind. In this state, your mind knows God, okay? For God is not symbolic. He is fact. Knowing his son as he is, this is so important. This is the most important teaching. And this is the one thing, if you're watching my blogs and you watch my talks, you'll know I keep repeating this. Knowing his son as he is. Be thyself knowing me. Know thyself. You realize that the atonement, not sacrifice, is the only appropriate gift for God's altar. Where's God's altar? Your heart where nothing except perfection belongs, okay? A gift to God's altar. Who's God's altar within yourself. So a gift to yourself, where nothing except perfection belongs. The understanding of, the inner, of, of innocence is truth, and you are innocent. Okay? That is why the altars are truly radiant. And how do you know an altar is radiant? Because it shines in their words, shines in their smile, it shines in their eyes. It shines in their beingness. It shines in their words, actions, thoughts, and the way they behave. They don't just sit and preach. They literally, truly live it. Okay, so we will now stop for now. We now continue with text chapter 3, um, verse 2 miracles as true perception so again it's alluding to the, the the heading of the chapter which is the innocent perception now perception as i've mentioned before we've got wrong-minded perception right-minded perception right-minded perception is innocent right my innocence is strength your true ability lies in your innocence because the son of god is innocent and therefore all powerful as god is because he's been given the power by god and so this chapter brings us into understanding that miracle-mindedness 
is true perception. It's the it's not yet knowledge because knowledge is in the realm of God. Because earthly knowledge is not true knowledge. It alludes to it. It's echoes of it. And so innocence brings us into right-minded perception and miracles are right-minded or true perception. So it's another way to look at the world and to look at it anew with new respect, to re-inspect is to look again and look at it and truly see your brother as innocent. And that's what it's that's what chapter three, um, section two is doing. I have stated so miracles is true perception. I have stated that the basic con the basic concepts referred to in this course are not matters of degree. There is no order of degree in difficult difficulty in miracles, and therefore there's no order of degree in illusions. It's either complete illusion or not at all. It's either light and nothing else. It's not light and darkness. There's only light. Darkness is misperceived light. Darkness is simply not seeing the reality that light is all there is. Certain fundamental concepts cannot be understood in terms of opposites. Here, yeah, so just I was just explaining it. It's impossible to conceive of light and darkness or everything and nothing as joint possibilities. They are either all true or false. So either light is true and darkness is false, or either darkness is true and light is false. They are either all true or false. It is essential, essential, that you realize your thinking will be erratic until a firm commitment to one or the other is made. And you hear a lot of Course in Miracles students that get to a certain part in the, state, in the course, especially if they only do the workbook, and it's, oh, I'm going to lose out and I'm going to lose this. I'm going to sacrifice. I'm sacrificing my lifestyle. And it's asking me not to do this. And it's like, oh, God's asking me to give up. No, it's not. There's nothing to give up. You don't give up illusions to get rid of illusions. You don't get rid of illusions to give up illusions. You don't destroy illusions because there's nothing to destroy. You don't try and process illusion, work through the illusion, workshop an illusion, to know the truth. You simply recognize that you're the Holy Son of God and that there is no such as illusion, no such thing as illusions. And what appears as physical matter, this world, body, minds, the universe, is misperceived light. It's light with filters in the way, filters of egoic ideals, preperceptions, prejudices, judgments. Okay. And those filters put enough of them in the way and the light cannot shine through. And so there is, it's not that there is no light, it's that there's an erroneous idea, fear, guilt, guilt, sin in the mind. And those, those filters of fear, guilt, sin play out in a myriad of ways, therefore preventing you from knowing yourself. When you look at your hand, you don't say the hand doesn't exist. Oh, the hand exists. The hand is actually very, very real. But the hand's actually pure light. The body's pure light. And everything between hand and, and, and light is light. So in pure light, if the hand is pure light, you won't see a hand. Why? Because there's only pure light. The fact that you see a body on the screen and it's talking to you is because we misperceive the truth. Now, some of the misperception of truth takes us into right-minded direction, but it's still symbols twice removed. And fully, when knowing, when, when God's knowledge is fully known, there's no word, there's no body, there's no universe. There's simply you as an extension of God's love, consciously aware that you are the extension of God's love and you being all of us as one. There's no separation between you and anyone when you finally awake. You just know self as the extension of God. A firm commitment to darkness or nothingness, okay, however, is impossible. No one has ever lived who has not experienced some light and something. No one, therefore, is able to deny truth totally. Thank goodness. So as much as you try, struggle to deny darkness, you also struggle to deny light. But the reality is at some stage, truth will be known and it will only be pure light. And I'm using light as a, as a concession to something that is beyond any word to explain. It's just in the knowing and when I say knowing, it's, it's a perceived understanding of it. 
There's no one therefore is able to deny truth totally, even if he thinks he can. Innocent, innocence is not a partial attribute. You either completely or not. Okay, it is not real until it is total. So you're not totally innocent until you fully realize you're totally innocent. The, part, the partly innocent are apt to be quite foolish at times. It is not until their innocence becomes a viewpoint with a universal application that it becomes wisdom because innocence is both sides. And the minute you've taken a side, you've fallen into the dream. Innocence, and this is again so beautiful, or true perception means the same, means that you never misperceive and always see true. So the innocent don't perceive but or misperceive and always see truly. More simply, it means that you will never see what does not exist and always see that what does. So those of you, people that are so drawn to the news, the war, the virus, the vaccine, the the war here, the war there, the, the GMO, the crops, the fucking uniform, the UFOs, the, the government conspiracies. What's happening? It's an inner condition and you look outwards. When you've let go of any investment in this little blue planet and the forests and the animals and the crops and the water and the earth and try to fix any of it, because you cannot fix illusions. You don't want to save the planet. You don't want to destroy it either. You don't, want to just, you don't want to destroy the rivers and destroy the oceans, destroy the forests, destroy the animals. You don't want to destroy anything. You don't want to save anything either because there's nothing to be saved. It's all projections of you. So you try and fix it there. It means that you're seeing it as real. You fix the viewer. You fix the observer, the decision maker. And what happens when the decision maker sees right-mindedness through the mind of Holy Spirit, it only sees light. Does the world stop con continuing for the rest of us, the rest of them? No. They will play out that screen as long as they need to. For you, though, it becomes pure light. And what happens is that joyous beingness that you are becomes all-pervading. You become so co completely aware of it. And what happens? That resonance draws you to the world where there's the similar vibration. Of course, the ego doesn't say Oh, I'll give up now. It comes and tempts you with ideas, with thoughts, with news, with traffic, with neighbors, with dogs barking, with cats, you know, chasing birds and bringing you birds in the nine o'clock in the morning, you know, just to, that will continue, but you no longer see it from a judgmental point. There's no more anger. There's no more resentment. There's no more fear. So more simply, it means that you will never see what does not exist and always see what does. What exists? Love. The love of self, the love of God, joy, happiness, um, spontaneity of creativity, inspiration. And you'll pour yourself knowingly like that. As Ruben often says, God lives in me and I live in God. Knowingly, not idea, concept. Enough concepts now. Religion has had 2,000 years to sell us concepts didn't work okay so let's go beyond religion into knowing when you lack confidence in what someone will do remember this when you start to judge others you are attesting to your belief that he is not in his right mind and if he's not right-minded who's seeing not right-minded there must be a judgment he's not right-minded she's not right-minded if we're wrong not right-minded she's not right-minded this is hardly a miracle-based frame of reference. It also has the disastrous effect of denying the power of the miracle. So why? You've put judgment in the way. And the minute you put judgment, fear, sin, guilt, miracle is unknown to you because you are that which is miracle. The miracle perceives everything as it is, love. It sees love everywhere, everything as love, even what you call unloving in the world you see as love. If nothing but the truth exists, which is true, right-minded seeing cannot see anything but perfect. So if you're looking upon a world and it's getting your emotions up and it's making you angry and it's making you defensive, I'm guilty of it too, realize at that moment in time, you are temporarily trapped in the idea of space and time. You're differently than trapped in the idea of body-minds as a reality, and therefore you are misperceiving, 
misprojecting and therefore judging. The minute you catch yourself judging anything, anything getting you emotionally charged, realize wrong-mindedness. Stop, don't judge it, don't beat yourself up. Don't question, why am I seeing this? Don't question, why is this happening to me? Don't question, why would I, what would have I done that's creating this experience? Be careful. Questioning mind is ego mind. Accepting mind is innocent. Look, no judge, remove yourself from that awareness. Right-minded thinking. Show me another way to see this. That's the only prayer you have. You're asking, Holy Spirit, memory of God within your heart, in your temple, show me another way to see this. I have said that only what God creates or what you create with the same will, willing love, loving will, has any real existence. So what is it that you truly create? As you extend yourself lovingly into what you once made, your creations, okay, we call it your creations, but the world, people, places, the universe is what you made. Now, when you pour yourself lovingly into all of it, you are now creating. What are you creating? You're turning darkness into light. You're turning matter into light. This then is all the innocent can see. They do not suffer from distorted perception. And what is distorted perception? It's called suffering. Suffering is distorted perception. To suffer is to see incorrectly because suffering is not possible in true reality. You are afraid of God's will because you have used your own mind, which he created in the likeness of his own, to miscreate. So the reason you fear is because you're afraid, because you miscreate. Not because of God, not because God's loving will, but because you're afraid you'll continue to miscreate. And what do you miscreate? People, places, things, and events. It's never made you happy. And this is why at some stage you start to get depressed. Life makes no sense. You want to give up. So, you know... I used to be so excited about this. I used to be so excited about that. I used to love doing this. I used to love doing that. Now nothing. There's no hit. There's no charge. Why? You've gone far enough into right-mindedness. Although you may, not be, you may not be steeped in it and completely bathed in it and completely abiding in it, you've touched it and it's changed you. And now it, there is no ego and people, places, things, and events. Egoic projections no longer impact on you. And you think, am I getting depressed? Well, the ego is being depressed, depressed like a grape. And all the ego juices are flowing out. What's going to leave behind the truth? Nothing else. The real mind, the loving mind of God's holy son. The mind can miscreate only when it believes it is not free. An imprisoned mind is not free because it is possessed or held back by itself. Its filters, its ideas, its ideologies its prejudices, its beliefs. It is therefore limited by beliefs, prejudices, and so on. And the will is not free to assert itself. If you were fully free to assert yourself, you could move mountains, but at the same time, you'd know mountains aren't real. So what would you move? To be one atonement is to be of one mind, atonement, or one will. When the will of the sonship and the father are one, as it is in heaven, okay? I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Their perfect accord is heaven. Nothing can prevail against the son of God, you, who commends his spirit into the hands of the father. Jesus' last words on the, on the cross. Into your hands I commend my spirit, father. That's it. By doing this, the mind awakens. The word awaken is often used in the course. So awakening, meaning we're dreaming from its sleep, the, the dream of the universe, and remembers first itself and its creator. So by knowing yourself, you remember your creator. Don't try and find God. You will never find God. Don't find, try and find Jesus. Find enlightenment. What you do find is the essence of yourself knowingly. And the essence of your God is an extension of the essence of God. And when you know that essence, you know the essence of everyone else is the same. And when you know the essence of everyone else, including yourself, is the same, it's also the same as that of your source, your God. When you know yourself, you know God. All sense of the separation disappears. Okay? So this is vital. And by doing this, the mind awakens from its sleep and remembers its creator. All sense of separation disappears. The Son of God 
is part, not a part, is part of the Holy Trinity. But the Trinity itself is one. Father, God, and Son, Holy Spirit is one. There is no confusion within its levels because they are, they are of one mind and one will. There's only one anyway. We use they for now because we're moving from duality to non-duality. This, this single purpose creates perfect integration and establishes the peace of God where? In your awareness, in your heart, and therefore pours out through you into your life and into everyone else's life. That's why people were drawn to Jesus whenever he came to town. They wanted to touch him. Of course, from an ego mind, the fear jumped up because it's pure blight, and the fear rejects it and then wants to attack it, wants to crucify it. Yet his vision can be perceived only by the truly innocent. Because their hearts are pure, pure, pure heart, pure, pure mind, the innocent defend to true perception instead of defending themselves against understanding the lesson of, and how do, you def, how do you defend it? You become it. It's not like you speak against it and you're attacking anything else. You have to speak the word that you live. You have to live what you speak and mind united and will united. Okay, so the understanding the lesson of the atonement they are without the wish to attack, and therefore, if they see truly, this is what the Bible means when he said, when it says, when, when he shall appear or be perceived, we shall be like him, for we shall, for we shall see him as he is. So we'll see him as we are, because we are like him, and we'll see him as he is. In other words, we'll see ourselves as the Holy Son of God. The, cor the way to correct distortions, the way to get rid of illusions, in other words, is to withdraw your faith in them and invest it only in what is true. You cannot make untruth true, and this is the problem, and this is the reason everybody is unhappy. You want to fix the world. You want to save the dolphins. You want to save the planet. You want to get rid of the evil people. This world is perfect because it's designed to bring us into flux into drama, into war, so that we eventually get so hutful. Hutful is a good South African word. It means I've had enough. There must be another way to see this. If you are truly willing, if you are willing to accept what is true in everything you perceive, you let it be true for you. And everything has the echo of yourself because everything is yourself projected through filters. So what you see as the world is a misperception of yourself. And therefore, mountains are movable, but there's no mountain. Truth overcomes all error. Indeed, it does. And those who live in error and emptiness can never find everlasting or lasting solace, as we all have, and hence turned inwardly and went non duality, found a course in miracles. If you perceive truly right-mindedness, you are canceling out misperceptions, wrong-mindedness in yourself and in others simultaneously. You want to end time? Don't try and fix the world. Fix yourself. And when you fix yourself, you fix everyone. Why? Everyone is a projection of you, the dreaming mind. Because you see them as they are, projections of yourself. You offer them your acceptance because you love yourself. You love your creations of their truth so they can accept it for themselves because they are you. And when one mind awakens, all minds benefit from that awakening because all minds are the activities of one single dreaming mind. This is the healing that the miracle induces. This is the at one man, the atonement. And I'll stop here and we'll. We'll do some questions now. So now we reach the, the third verse, uh, third section in chapter three, and that is perception versus knowledge. Now, this is where I really ask you to empty the cup, okay? So especially around the word perception and definitely around the word knowledge. What we call knowledge in the world is knowledge of the world. So it's knowledge of how the world 
works. Even the most high non-dual knowledge, like as in non-duality, is not true knowledge because even the word non-duality doesn't exist in true reality. But they're temporary perceptions that bring us into, into letting go of all perception. So like forgiveness is an activity that gets rid of the need to forgive. It's the final illusion that gets rid of all illusions. So right-minded perception, which is still perception, eventually dissolves into awakened mind. So get rid of your identification with the word knowledge as in something of value in terms of true reality. Knowledge, true knowledge, cannot be known by the dreamer. And so how can I be talking about that if I'm a projection of the dreamer? Because I'm looking at it from a corrected perspective, corrected projection. So I'm on the right track, yet not fully there, because if I was fully there, you wouldn't see me on the screen. It would be no screen, and I would be just a voice in your mind, like Christ, Holy Spirit, is a voice in your mind, in your awareness. So right-mindedness, Jesus dissolves into the light, into the right-minded, the atone mind, the Christ mind, and can no longer be seen by those who can see, because those who can see are seeing with eyes, body-mind eyes, which aren't real. So this body-mind, which isn't real and was actually made to observe God's power, cannot know the truth, and therefore will never have true knowledge. But miracles intercede and give us corrected perception, correct perception. Okay, so we have been emphasizing perception and have said very little about knowledge as yet. There's a reason for that, because you'll also see it's still using the word yourself as one word, whereas in later chapters, it breaks it up into your capital S self. So it's, it's taking us through a path. Ken once said, Jesus lies to us in order to bring us the truth. This isn't lying to us. This is Jesus is guiding us. Christ is guiding us slowly. He's gently boiling the frog until the frog realizes it's not a frog. There is no frog. Okay. And this is because perception must be straightened out. In other words, corrected before you can know anything. The word emphasized here is no. To know is to be certain. And let ask yourself, how often have you been completely certain about someone, something, someplace, only to realize, oh, just an idea. Principal says, I want to see you on Monday morning. Panic the whole weekend. You arrive at the principal's office. You're expecting to get punished. He says, hey, I'm thinking of making you head girl. Wow, that I misperceive that story. You know, how many times hasn't that happened to you? Okay, and so to be certain and certainty is strength, total certainty. Think about yourself when you're manifesting in this world, even if you're egoically manifesting, when you're certain of what you want in your illusions, you manifest. Perception is temporary. Even right-minded perception is temporary. An attribute of the belief in space and time, wow, here it goes, the belief in space and time, is subject either to fear or love. So the belief in space, time, now here, okay, creates the projection of either love or fear. Misperceptions produce fear. So every time you're afraid, every time you feel any pang of fear, you have misperceived. Choose again, ask to be shown. And true perception fosters love, right minded thinking but neither bring certainty because all perception varies. That's why it is not knowledge. True perception is the basis, the foundation for knowledge, but knowing is the affirmation of truth and beyond all perception. So while we're in body mind, we're either perceiving falsely wrong mind or correctly right mind, miracle mindedness. But True perception doesn't exist because it's either knowledge or perception. So true perception is a direction until knowing is known. 
And here it goes. All your difficulties stem from the fact you do not recognize yourself. Recognize yourself. Or your brother or God. To recognize means to know again. Implying, and you know where I'm going with this because you often hear me say this, implying that you knew before. Who did you know before? God. Who did you know before? Yourself as the loving son of God, the extension of God's love. You can see in many ways because perception involves interpretation. Of course, interpretation through your ideas, ideologies, beliefs. And this means that it is not whole or consistent. Why? Because you're constantly changing. You're constantly evolving. You're constantly learning more. Or if you're truly learning, unlearning, letting go of. The miracle being a way of perceiving. Ah, oh, this is beautiful. I'm going to change the color. The miracle as a way of perceiving is not knowledge. It's getting you there. It is the right answer to, the quest, to a question, but you do not question when you know. Why? Questioning illusions is the first step in undoing them. The miracle or the right answer, so the miracle is the right answer, corrects them. Since perceptions change, their dependence on time is obvious, and that's the reason time exists. Holy Spirit has given us or has allowed us to create space, time, pulling ourselves apart, space and time, here and there and now, in order for us to remember that there's always only here. How you perceive at any given time determines what you do and how you think and, why you, and how you play. And actions must occur in time because it appears to happen because there's no real action when all there is is light. Knowledge is timeless or timeless. And the reason it's timeless is because it's always here. It's always eternal. Eternal means always now, not forever as in forever in, in terms of future. It's always here now because certainty is not questionable. Okay. You know when you have ceased to ask questions. So while, and this is why, so while there's questions, you know, in your ego mind, and while the ego says, what have I done to deserve this? Why is this happening? Why is this good? Why is this bad? What have I done to create this? What am I doing that I haven't found love or found happiness or know myself? The minute you're questioning, it's the wrong-minded self-questioning. Right-minded question accepts what is. Sorry, right-minded perception accepts what is. Wrong-minded perception questions everything, including itself, and eventually confuses itself until there's two parts fighting with, its, with itself. And that's how it keeps itself trapped in wrong-mindedness. I'm keeping it in purple because it's that important. The questioning mind perceives itself in time and therefore looks for future answers. Why? Because it wants to know that it's not going to recreate the past horrible pain, suffering, and recreate it in the future. It's astrology because we want to know the future. We want to read the tarot cards. We want to be told what's going to happen in the future. Why? Because the questioning wrong mind perceives itself in time and looks for different futures, a happier future, and wants certainty of a happier future, but in the illusion. It doesn't want to dissolve the illusion and awaken to the joyful nature of self in God. It wants to remain in the illusion and bring heaven here. The closed mind believes the future and the present will be the same. Let me repeat that. The closed mind believes the future and the present, misery, will be the same. Okay? Hence, it wants to perceive itself in time and look for the future, tarot, psychics. Why? Because it wants to, it hopes that it's going to hear a better message. But the message is still in the illusion. And here we go. And this establishes a seeming stable state that is usually an attempt to counteract the underlying fear that the future will be worse than the present. This fear inhibits the tendency to question at all. Because we don't want to look. Because we're afraid of what we're going to see. 
or we go to the psychic half scared in the hope that psychic is going to pull out a card and go, oh, your future is beautiful. Why? Because the mind doesn't know itself as the eternal love of God and therefore needs something to tell it, something magic, something extraordinary, something special, someone special to tell us, oh, your future is okay. It's going to be a man or a beautiful woman, a beautiful job, a new whatever. When you know yourself as the love of God, what is it that you can't create? Or what is it that you want to create? But the love of God itself extended. Do you still want people, places, things, and events? Do you still want to play in the illusion when you know yourself as the love of God? Or do you want to return knowingly as that love into all minds and share that self in the most joyful, happy way you can with others? If you're not stepping into a room and people light up and their faces light up, you're not being the Christ you are. True vision is the natural perception of spiritual sight. No more tarots, no more psychics, no more anything needed. No more vision boards needed because natural perception is true vision and true vision is joy. But it is still a correction rather than a fact. Why? You're still in body mind. So it's correcting you. It's making you see heaven-like. You're starting to see through the eyes of Christ. You're starting to see Christ in all. You're starting to see perfection everywhere. You're starting to see an echo for the voice of God in everything. And therefore loving everything because everything reminds you of God's love. Spiritual sight is symbolic and therefore not a device for knowing. Okay, but it's going in the right direction. It is, however, a means of right perception, right-mindedness which brings into the proper domain of a miracle. A vision of God would be a miracle rather than a revelation. So it's induced for you. It's given to you. The fact that a perception is involved at all removes the experience from the realm of knowledge. Because the minute you're perceiving, you're in dream state. That's why visions, however holy, do not last. Here we go. Okay. My favorite. Get quite excited. I'm like a child here. The Bible tells you, know yourself or be certain of who you are. Certainty is always of God. When you love someone, you perceive him as he is, meaning as yourself, because it's all you. And this makes it possible for you to know him. Until you first perceive him as he is, you cannot know him, therefore you cannot know yourself. While you ask questions about him, find fault with him, judge him or her, okay? You are clearly implying that you do not know God because what you look upon in every single human being is God. It's the son of God which is an extension of God and therefore one with God, Son, Holy Spirit, and, and Father are one. The Trinity becomes one. And what you are seeing is misperceived projections of God. Misperceived by who? You. Misprojected by you? You. Your body, mind, separation, identity. Certainty does not require action because knowing has no need to do anything. I need do nothing. I simply am. When you say you are acting on the basis of knowledge, you are act, you're really confusing knowledge with perception. You may be confusing knowledge with true perception, but nevertheless, you are confusing it with perception. Okay. So knowledge provides the strength for creative thinking, but not for right doing. Perception, so what does that mean? You can't act because it's not no longer real. Perception Miracles and doing are closely related. Okay, remember this. Because the minute the miracle happens, you act. Why? Because you're still in the dream. You're in right-minded perception. Miracles taken place. And you're now becoming the light of the world until God takes the final step. Knowledge is the result of revelation and induces only thought. Awareness comes through. Conscious awakened awareness the knowing of oneself and there we go know yourself know thyself 
and it comes, we talk about it further down as well. Knowledge is the result of revelation and induces only thought. Even in its most spiritualized form, perception involves the body, people, places, things, and events. Knowledge comes from the altar, the heart space, the, the memory of God, the holy of holies, the Holy Spirit of God within you, within. And it is timeless because it is certain. Okay. So true knowledge is, in other words, the knowing of yourself as the love of God. To perceive the truth is not the same as to know it. Right-minded perception, right perception is necessary before God can communicate directly to his altars, which he established in his son. Now, I want to just touch on this for a little while, and I just want to play with it for a little while, because it's this important. And you often hear people, oh, holier than thou, and they've, God's just spoken to them. And you hear a lot of religious people, God spoke to me, and he said I should do this, and I shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. ah, shouldn't, shouldn't. It's not in the realm, because there's nothing to do. In, if God's talking to you, there's nothing to do. There's everything to be. And when vision comes, okay, which is God's Holy Spirit, then transforms wrong-mindedness into right-mindedness and appears as vision, then you'll act. But conversations with God don't happen. Neil Donald Walsh, good title. The conversation is actually with your highest self and therefore your Holy Spirit, which is the extension of God or the voice for God in the dream. So Neil Donald Walsh, Talking to God is actually talking to God's Holy Spirit. Neil Donald Walsh is watching this. Just understand he knows. But if anyone's going to judge that, realizing God's Holy Spirit is an extension of God. So you are conversing with God, but God doesn't know the dream or the dream is mine. And therefore, he's spoken his voice into it. And the voice intercedes between illusions and reality so that illusions dissolve and reality is known. There he can communicate his certainty and his knowledge will be will bring peace without question. If you have questions, you don't have peace. God is not a stranger to his son, and his sons are not strangers to each other. Why? Because there's only one. Knowledge precedes both perception and time and will ultimately replace knowledge and time, I mean, perception and time. The, this is the real meet, meaning of the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, okay? And before Abraham was... I am. Perception can and must be stabilized, but knowledge is stable. What does it mean by perception must be stabilized? In, you know, as we're getting there, wrong-minded thinking, right-minded thinking, wrong-minded thinking, right-minded thinking. After a while, you're fluctuating more, more, more towards the right-minded thinking, but every now and again, you fall back into the old patterns, the old traps, the old ideals, the old judgments, the old stigmas, the old preceptions, the old prejudices. And after a while, more and more time in the right-mindedness, you start to see a new, a new world appears before you. Is there a new world? No, you just start to perceive love everywhere. So perception can and must be stabilized, but knowledge is stable. And so you, once you stabilize, God takes a final step and full knowing. Fear God and keep his commandments becomes know God and accept his certainty. And another way of saying that is be thyself knowingly. Okay. If you attack error in another, you will hurt yourself. So remember this, because what are you hurting? You're hurting projections of yourself. So if you're cruel to someone else, you say something hurtful, you attack someone in thought, in word, in deed. You're hurting only you because it's all you. It's all you. You cannot know your brother when you attack him. Attack is always made upon a stranger. You are making it well. You know, you wouldn't say that between, you know, mothers and daughters and fathers and sons or sometimes mothers and sons too. But attack is because you don't know them as they truly are. And as they truly are as an extension of you, a projection of you, a projection of the Holy Son of God, the Son of God, the extension of God's love. So you're attacking love. And how does it feel when you're being loving and kind and considerate and compassionate to parents, to children, to friends, and they attack you? It doesn't feel good. Why? 
because love doesn't want and cannot stand the, 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 the energy of darkness, of attack, because love is defenseless. And so that's why you feel hurt. When you're feeling hurt and someone's attacked you and you're being innocent and kind and wanting to help, why do you feel hurt? It's because it's love, okay, misfiltered through your projection and therefore it feels like hurt. Because when you're feeling hurt, what you're actually feeling is knowing yourself as love, but because you don't know yourself, that knowing comes through as hurt. Remember, the next time you feel hurt by another, it's reminding you, I am love. So the next time you feel hurt, just remember, I am love. This is not hurt. This is love pouring through. You're making him a stranger by misperceiving him. And so you cannot know him. So the minute there's an attack thought, there's a projection through a filter, a perception thereof. It is because you have made him a stranger that you're afraid of him. And that's why we attack. We are we're attacked because we're afraid of being attacked. Perceive him correctly so that you can know him. The minute you know him, you know yourself. Okay. So when you perceive others correctly, you know them as the son of God, as you are. There are no stra strangers in God's, God's creation. To create as he created, you can, sorry, to create as he created, you can create only what you know and therefore accept as yours. God knows his children with perfect certainty. He created them by knowing them. He recognized them perfectly as extensions of himself. When they do not recognize each other, they do not and cannot and will not recognize him. So remember this. When you're judging others, you're actually judging yourself and you're actually judging God. Judgment is always a judgment of truth and you're judging God, the only reality, the only truth. Food for thought. It's a bit of a challenge. So we now move on to section four, error and the ego. Um, and it just, it's just, again, I mean, it just, this course is just so beautiful and so profound. And, and this specific section is one of my favorite parts because it really, if you fully get this, if you fully know this, it just shifts and you'll hear you know, those of you that have been listening to me for the last couple of years, you'll realize I'm using many of these words often. The abilities you now possess, so it's, it's sort of tongue in cheek, spirits like playing with us here, is the abilities you now possess, because you think you've, oh, you've now learned some real good things, you know, wow, look at you, are only shadows of your real strength. Isn't this beautiful? It's just teasing you. So the abilities you now possess are only shadows of your real strength. And you're like, wow, this is amazing. It gets better. All of your present functions <laughs> are divided and open to questions and doubt. And this is important. So while you're divided and open to questions and doubt, ego is still playing, which means you're still fluctuating between wrong-mindedness, right-mindedness, wrong-mindedness, right-mindedness, wrong-mindedness, wrong-minded, wrong-minded, right-mindedness. You know, and so realize that you've now touched on right-mindedness, miracle-minded thinking, you know, becoming aware of God's Holy Spirit all pervading through you, but you not fully believe it yet, not fully completely given your faith over to it. So when you're divided, divided, uncertain, unsure, wrong-mindedness. This is because you are not certain, and here's the other word, how. You're not certain how you will use them. Why? Because you've been so used to you decide your life, you make manifest, that now that you've got this incredible new way of looking at it, you're not sure what to do with it. So what do you do? Hmm, you're going to try and figure it out. Well, you can't figure it out. You hand it over, okay? Because you're not certain how you will use them and therefore are incapable of knowledge because you're not sure. I mean, imagine yourself 30 years ago before the cell phone and someone gave you a cell phone, a mobile phone, you wouldn't know what to do with it, okay? Now you can operate a mobile phone while eating taco cake and driving 
and talking on the phone. You can multitask. It's no longer something special. A mobile phone is an extension of your hand nowadays. Okay? Because then you have, you have knowledge on how it works and true knowledge of the divine is the same. You are also incapable of knowledge because you can still perceive lovelessly. So whether you perceive yourself lovelessly or others lovelessly or Mr. Putin lovelessly or Hitler or anything else, okay, you are incapable of knowledge because you're trapped in wrong-minded thinking because you believe Hitler and Putin are real. You believe the war is real. You believe the vaccine is real. The virus is real. Perception did not exist until the separation induced degrees, aspects, and intervals. Spirit, the truth of you, has no levels. And all conflicts arise from the concept of levels. The only level only levels of the Trinity are capable of unity. Okay? Only the levels of, of the Trinity, because there's only three, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and they are one. The levels created by the separation cannot but conflict. This is because levels are meaningless to each other. In actual fact, they're not aware of each other. Cannot be. Truth cannot know illusion. Illusion cannot see truth. Consciousness, now, in my books, I speak of God as pure consciousness and the dream world realm as awareness. So those of you that have read my books or reading my books, I bring it about very slightly different to a course because the, talk, the course takes us straight into non-duality, whereas my books take the readers from duality. In other words, I explain the spirit world and the dynamics of the spirit world and then gradually make them realize that the spirit world and this world are no more real than one another. They're both dream, dream state. Okay. And so I, I use the word awareness to bring us into conscious awareness and then eventually pure consciousness being God. However, in the Course in Miracles, it uses consciousness slightly different or very differently. So in the Course, it says consciousness, the level of perception. So consciousness as in the human is conscious. Okay. I'm awake, meaning conscious. So awake is in this world, physicality. Consciousness, the level of perception, was the first split introduced into the mind, fallen asleep, fallen asleep son of God's mind, after the separation. So the minute he fell asleep, consciousness became the activity of his dream, making the mind the perceiver rather than a creator. So what we call the creation is actually a, the perception. There is nothing created. Okay? Consciousness is correctly identified as the domain of the ego. So it's the ego that becomes more and more conscious levels, eventually fully awakens, and the ego dissolves. The ego is a wrong-minded attempt to perceive yourself, so wrong-minded, incorrect way, misperceived way, to, to perceive yourself as you wish to be body, mind, reality, beautiful, loved, loved by others, recognized by others, acknowledged by others, rather than as you are, the perfect love of God. Perfect. No need for any activity, any recognition, any appraisal, any, any external love because you are love itself. Yet you can, you can know yourself only as you are because that is all you can be sure of. Everything else is open to question. And I'm going to highlight it in purple because yet you can know yourself. You see where I'm going with this? It's my favorite chapter. Know yourself. Be yourself knowingly. Know the self as the Holy Son of God and you shall know your Father. Okay. Ego is the questioning aspect of the post-separate self. So, Questioning is of the ego because knowing is of spirit. So questioning is wrong-mindedness. Now, at some stage, as right-mindedness is induced, as you invite Holy Spirit to take over, you'll still fluctuate between wrong-mindedness 
and right-mindedness. If you've got level confusion and conflict, it's two parts of wrong-mindedness in conflict. Right-mindedness never fights with wrong-mindedness because right-mindedness, true perception, can, does, not want, does not see illusion, and illusion cannot know true perception. So it's not those two fighting. If there ever conflict inside you, it's wrong-minded conflict fighting with itself. Okay? So the ego is the questioning aspect of the post-separation self. Oh, yes. So the dreamer, which was made rather than created. Created is by God. God created his son, and his son fell asleep and made the world, made the universe, made body minds, made the spirit world. It is capable of asking questions, but not of perceiving meaningful answers, because these would involve knowledge and cannot be perceived. Knowledge cannot be perceived. Knowledge is known. Perceived is truth filtered through ideas and therefore known through all these filters, therefore not known as they truly are. And as a consequence, the mind is therefore confused because only one-mindedness can be without confusion. A separate or divided mind must be confused. It is, a, it, is it is necessarily uncertain about what it is. And that is the reason there is so much conflict in this world. Because if you knew your brother as yourself and you knew your, your brother as the love of God, would you ever attack anyone? Would you ever hurt anyone? Would you ever love one person more than the rest? Oh, special love relationship. So if you truly knew your brother as yourself, as the Holy Son of God, as the love of God, as the extension of the dream. If you, the dreamer, realize you're dreaming, would you still be searching for love in your dream? Or would you be pouring the love you are into all your dream character? It has to be in conflict because it is out of accord with itself. Now, at this stage of the book, it's not capitalizing self. Okay? And the reason is it hasn't actually explained capital S self as the true son of God. And I've been teaching this course for a while. You've been following me for a while. So you realize that what it's alluding to, it's out of accord with the capital S self. And so that's why you're, you're at this stage, the course, it's addressing us as yourself, one and all. This makes its aspects, strange aspects, characters in the dream, people, places, things and events, strangers to each other. And in this is the essence of fear-prone condition in which attack is always possible. Okay. So what are we? We aspects in the dreamer's mind. Aspects become strangers because they know not themselves as extensions of the dreamer. He has the truth being revealed. Okay. And as a consequence, you're looking upon reflections of yourself must perceive projections of yourself and seeing them as your enemy. Why? Because you don't recognize yourself, therefore you don't recognize them. And because you've fallen asleep or whatever you created, you destroyed. You believe God would do the same and you believe your brother would do the same. You have every reason to feel afraid as you perceive yourself incorrectly. This is why you cannot escape from fear until you realize that you did not and could not create yourself. And therefore, if you did not and could not create yourself, you cannot and will not find the way out. This is why the surrender to God's Holy Spirit and ask God's Holy Spirit to show you another way and to lift you from the stream is the only way you will awaken. You cannot do it by yourself. You can't meditate yourself to awakeness. You can't yoga yourself. You can't eat yourself awake. You can't prana yourself awake. You can't mushroom yourself awake. You'll get glimpses, but no more. Because glimpses of illusion through illusion is more illusion. And glimpses of reality through misperceived illusion remains in the realm of illusion. It may call you and you may move closer too, but until you fully surrender, let go, let God, and ask Holy Spirit to guide you to see anew, because it's not to do in you, it's not to go in you, it's not to find yourself somewhere out there. It's to recognize yourself 
as you are. You can never make your misperceptions true. No matter how real you want to, no matter how much you love your doggy, he's not going to live forever. No matter how much you love your spouse, you can't live forever. No matter how much you love your children, you can't live forever. And your creation is beyond your own era. And therefore, what God created does never die. But what you misperceive appears to die or disappear or move away or hurt you. That is why you must eventually choose to heal the separation. And it's a choice. It's I align my will with your will. Thy will be done. And yeah, it comes. Right-mindedness is not to be confused with the knowing mind. Okay, one of you asked me earlier. So right-mindedness is in the right direction, but it's not knowing because it's still in the small mind-mindedness. And the knowing mind is the capital M mind of God because it is applicable only to right perception. You can be right-minded or wrong-minded. Oops. And even this is subject to degrees. Very, very wrong-minded, not so badly wrong-minded, slightly wrong-minded. Slightly right-minded, fully right-minded. Clearly demonstrating that knowledge is not involved because when you know, you know, you're out of small mind, you're awake. The term right mindedness is properly used as the correction for wrong mindedness. So it's an illusion that corrects illusion, it's an illusion that dispels all other illusions and applies to a state of mind that induces accurate perception so you start to see correctly you start to see through the eyes of christ you start to see christ in everyone it is miracle minded because it heals misperception so the true miracle is the getting rid of the illusion of misperceiving and this is indeed a miracle in view of how you perceive yourself Perception always involves some misuse of mind because it brings, to the, mind, brings the mind into areas of uncertainty. Okay? So it misuses it, uncertainty, fear, sin, guilt. The mind is very active. The ego is, in actual fact, an active attack thought system. When it chooses to be separate, separate it chooses to perceive. So separation is the realm of perception. Until then, it wills only to know itself, God. Know thyself, be thyself knowing. Afterwards, it can, it can only choose ambiguously, so quite vague. And the only way out of ambiguity is clear perception. Holy Spirit, show me another way to see this. Clear perception. Show me another way. The mind returns to its proper function only when it wills to know. I will to will thy will. Amen. This places it. This is amazing. This is the miracle. This places it in, its, in the service of spirit. Can't I underline that enough. Where perception is changed. The mind chooses to divide itself when it chooses to make its own level. It could be old soul, young soul, good soul, angels, levels and levels and levels. The, the, the 12 levels of the spirit world and the Akashic records and all our nonsense that spiritual people talk about, just levels of, oh, and I'm psychic and I'm clairvoyant and I'm special. Nonsense. Throw all that nonsense away. You're either awake in God or you're dreaming. You can have special gifts in the dream, but it's still dream. Or you're awake and know yourself lovingly as the love of God. Okay, but it, so it chooses its own levels, but it could not entirely separate itself from spirit, thank goodness, because it is from spirit that it derives its whole power to make or create. It derives its whole power to make or create. Make more of the world, people, places, things, and events, create, extend love. 
even in miscreation, the mind is affirming its source. Why? Because source, God is in everything. We abide in God and God abides in us. We rest in God, God rests in us. And so everything is in God. So if God wasn't everywhere, even this illusion would not appear because God is the light with which I see, even my own miscreated illusion. Without God, I wouldn't know, wouldn't see, wouldn't exist. Okay? So the mind is affirming its source or it would merely cease to be. It just wouldn't exist. This is impossible because the mind belongs to spirit. It's just been, what is wrong mind is when mind has been given over to ego. Right mind is mind in its own place, the activating agent of spirit, which God created and is therefore eternal. Always yeah, always now, always forever, never changing. The ability to perceive made the body possible. Wrong-mindedness, perception made the body possible. Why? It's a misperception, misprojection of love, of pure light, because you must perceive something with something. So the true self is perceiving the false illusion with its self, with projection of the light that it is. That is why perception involves an exchange or translation. And when it's a glad exchange, it seeks mercy, not sacrifice. In other words, forgiveness brings about a glad exchange, which knowledge doesn't need because knowledge has no need for forgiveness or illusions or exchange anything. Because how can you exchange everything if you are everything? The interpretive function of perception, a distorted form of creation, so that's all it is. So what you see in the universe, people, places, things, events, the world of mind bodies is a distorted form of love. So it's not that the world's an illusion doesn't exist. It exists. But it's misperceived. What you see out there is all you filtered through your misperception of fear, guilt, and sin. When those misperceptions dissolve, when those filters dissolve, what do you know? Yourself. And what will you see? If you could see, you'd see pure light. And where would your brothers be? Part of that pure light. And they'd be just as light as everything else. Would you see separation? No. You'd only see the love and light, which is God, and then which you're a part of. Okay? So the interpretive function of perception, a distorted form of creation, then permits you to interpret the body as yourself in attempt to escape from the light that you are, from the love that you are, from the conflict you have induced. Spirit, which knows, and only spirit knows, could not be reconciled with loss of power because it is incapable of darkness. There's not light and darkness. There's only light. Darkness is a misperception of light. Okay? In other words, not just the absence of light. It's a misperceived light particle. This makes spirit almost inaccessible to the mind. Ooh, here's the trick word. I'm going to highlight it in blue. Almost, not completely. This makes spirit almost, almost, almost inaccessible to the mind and entirely inaccessible to the body. So if you'd ever met or know of people like Ramana Maharashi, you'll realize that it wasn't inaccessible to him and hence the continuous miracle-mindedness when Jesus was around. So whenever people felt his presence, he was in the same town and they would feel this overwhelming sense of love and they'd go all rushing in one direction. They just want to sit there and abide in his presence because that body-mind dissolved even though it was still in the dream and, and, it act, and it accessed the mind of God. So can you in this lifetime do it? Absolutely. Should you in this lifetime do it? Absolutely. That should be your priority. Above all else, seek you first the kingdom as yourself, and all else shall follow. Thereafter, spirit is perceived as a threat. Why? Because light abolishes darkness merely by knowing you, by showing you that it's not there. And people hate the idea of dissolving and, have, and forgetting ever having existed, or for dissolving and ever, ever known others, or their lives, or what they've done, all the good things they did. We want to hang on to illusions, you want to bring heaven here at the same time. No, not possible. Truth will always overcome error in this way. 
This cannot be act. Sorry, this cannot be an active process of correction because, as I've already emphasized, knowledge does not do anything. Knowledge is the realm of God, and it simply is. It can be perceived as an attacker, but it cannot attack. Now, why would you perceive God's love or God's knowledge as an attack? Because it eradicates all your illusions. The universe dissolves, doesn't exist. The <laughs> can you imagine telling people, when you know God, the universe will dissolve and you won't even exist. You'll just know yourself as an extension of God. People are petrified of that. What happens to me? What happens to my past? What happens to the things I do? What happens to my family? My dog, okay? My husband and my lover, okay? It just dissolves. What you perceive as its attack is your own vague recognition that knowledge can always be remembered. Always be remembered, never having been destroyed. Know yourself. Remember yourself. God and his creations remain in surety and therefore know that no micro-creation exists. Micro-creation, the universe, micro-creation in the dreamer's dream. Truth cannot deal with errors that you want. Okay, let's underline that a hundred million times. Truth cannot deal with errors that you want. So I want a lover, I want a house, I want a job, I want a this, I want to heal, I want to fix, I want to help, help others, I want the war to end. Jesus help, Christ help, the Holy Spirit help. I want to end this, I want to fix that, I want this, I want that. God, why aren't you giving me this? God, please give me a lover. Jesus, please send me a friend. Cannot, because you're in the dream asking that which is in reality to bring you into a happy dream when what you're really wanting to know is to see in you so that you realize I am love. And yet Jesus says, so Christ's mind is speaking as Jesus. I am a man who remembered spirit and its knowledge. So remember earlier on I said, almost, not completely, almost impossible. Jesus did it, and if you're willing to fully let go, let go of all your investment in this world and purely be the love you are, it is possible. As a man, I did not attempt to counteract error with knowledge, but to correct error from the bottom up, to see it anew. I demonstrated both the power, powerlessness of the body and the power of the mind, spirit, by uniting my will with that of my creator, God, I naturally remembered spirit and its real purpose. I cannot unite your will with God's for you, but I can erase all misperceptions from your mind if you will bring it under my guidance. And why don't we bring it under Christ's guidance? Okay, because we're afraid of authority. and We want to hang on to our autonomy because our autonomy is our idea of self, and it's this idea of self that makes us believe that we are special and therefore alive. Only your miscreations stand in your way. Without them, your choice is certain. Sane perception induces sane choosing, right-minded choosing. Choose again. I cannot choose for you, but I can help you make your own right choice. And he's doing it by teaching us this course. Many are called, but few are chosen should be all are called and few choose to listen. And then the other one, therefore, they do not choose right. The chosen ones are merely those who chose right sooner. Those who chose right sooner, because we all get to choose at some stage or another. Right minds can do this now and should do this now, and they will find Rest unto their soul. They rest in God. God knows you only in peace. And it is this, and this is your reality. God knows you only in peace. And this is your reality. How beautiful. Stop there.